Hi, I am Mirko Böhm, an authorized Qt trainer from KDAB. Welcome to this learning video based on the material for the Qt Essentials training course. With these videos, we'll be giving you key insights into Qt. We will also demonstrate the type of in-depth training available in the classroom-based Qt Essentials training course. In this video, we will show you how Qt extends the basic C++ object model with features that are needed for GUI development. These features include memory management, event handling and dynamic properties. They are also the base for the signal and slot mechanism, which is very fundamental to Qt and will be covered later. The heart of the Qt object model is the QObject base class. Every class that uses signals and slots, dynamic properties or the memory management provided by the Qt object model directly or indirectly inherits QObject. QObject adds all these features except the visual representation. So anything that's appearing on the screen in a GUI program inherits QWidget, which is a QObject and it extends it with the visual representation. Many of the features that QObject adds to your class are regular C++ and are just inherited. Some of the features, though, are created by Qt's meta object system, and that uses an external code generator tool, and this will be covered later in the signals and slots video. The queue objects in your application form a tree. Every queue object can have a parent, a parent object, and um, if it has a parent, it's supposed to be owned by that parent. A queue object can also have a list of children, a set of children, and these children are then supposed to be owned by this queue object itself. Now, if you think about this in a bigger perspective, you see all the queue objects in your application forming a tree of objects, which you can traverse, for example, to visit all the objects in your application. The parent is assigned to the queue object at a time of creation, usually, and is passed in as a constructor argument. During the constructor, the object will register with its parent. So once the constructor of the base class is complete, the object is known to be a child for that object. It is important not to confuse the concept of the object tree with inheritance. Um, developers are used to thinking in class hierarchies, but the object hierarchy in your application doesn't have anything to do with the class hierarchy. The only requirement is that the objects in your tree are all inheriting Q object. The, a, pa a child object of a parent doesn't necessarily have to inherit the class of the parent itself. One feature that Q object adds to its inheriting classes is memory management. Every queue object that you create and that you pass a parent to during construction will be registered with that parent. And when that parent is deleted, it will delete this queue object too. That is called ownership. The parent owns the child. Every child object that you create and that you give your own object as a parent will be deleted when your object is destroyed. This system usually leads to the fact that in queue programs, you don't see many calls to delete but you see many calls to new. All the memory management of the dynamically allocated queue objects is pretty much done automatically. It does, this doesn't mean that you cannot delete a queue object explicitly at a certain point of time. When you do so, the object unregisters, unregisters with its parent, and will also delete its children. If this system is applied properly, then it leads to pretty stable and maintainable code, and it makes sure that no object is deleted twice, but every object is deleted. So if your queue objects take care of memory management, how are you supposed to create them then? Usually every class that inherits queue object is created dynamically. You're using new, you're passing in all the arguments to that class, and the last parameter to your object, uh, to the constructor call, is the parent. The parent takes the ownership to the object, which means it will delete it when it's done, when it's deleted. And um, you cannot usually copy a queue object. The copy constructor of queue object is disabled, it's private. This means that if you want another one, you have to clone it somehow, you can't copy it. There are some classes in Qt that also start with the letter Q, so they look like queue objects, but they're not. They're not inheriting the queue object class. Um, examples for that are queue string list, a list of queue strings, or um, queue color, a color representation. These are just simple value objects that you can create um, locally as variables and you're not creating those with new. If you are unsure about that, first of all, look if your class is inheriting queue object. If it's not, then you can just create it as a local variable. There are some exceptions though. Some 
classes that inherit queue object are usually created as local variables. A typical example is our dialogues. If you're creating a dialog, for example, a queue file dialog to choose a file in a file system, this dialog is usually created in the function where it's shown and destructed at the end of this block. If you're unsure on about how to do this, then the best way is probably to look at example code. There are many examples of how to show dialogues and how to create widgets in Qt or also in, um, in the documentation, in the reference documentation. And um, if you just follow these examples, you'll be fine. I, I mentioned earlier that queue object takes care of pretty much everything that the Qt object model provides except the visual representation. For that, we have another class that's called queue widget. Queue widget inherits queue object, so it has the same features, memory management and signals and slots and everything we mentioned earlier. Um, and it adds just the visual representation. So a queue widget is always something that will show up on your screen when it's visible. And therefore, queue widget is the base class for every visual component that you're writing yourself. So Qt comes with a lot of widgets. They all inherit queue widget. And if you're making your own widget, then you will directly or indirectly inherit queue widget as well. Queue widget is the, the base class for receiving events that are related to the, um, to the windowing system, like mouse clicks, keyboard input, resizes, these kinds of things. So um, this is functionality that's added on top of queue object. Queue widget therefore also takes care of painting. So a queue object that's not visible doesn't require to be painted at all. And a queue widget in the base class is just paints just a regular gray rectangle. And classes that inherit queue widget then will change this widget to look like something more familiar, like a button or a label. In this case, we've talked earlier about the object tree. The queue object tree so far was responsible for, for memory management, for deleting the objects, um, the child objects on destruction. In this case, for widgets, the queue object tree is also the nesting on the screen. So a parent widget that has a child that is a push button, for example, will show this push button within its window. And this can be nested again, of course, like a hierarchical structure. And that's how you create more complex user interfaces, by combining existing widgets into an object tree. Now, everything that is supposed to be visible within a widget must be a widget itself. You cannot combine that with a queue object, of course. When we're looking at queue widget, there is one very special situation. And that is, what is if a queue widget doesn't have a parent? For a queue object, something non-visual, we wouldn't really mind. It's just not visible. Um, it's just an object with no parent. For a queue widget, we said that the widget is shown within the window of its parent. So what does this mean? It's actually quite simple. A widget that has no parent or a zero parent becomes a desktop window. It's your application, more or less. The application that shows up on the desktop is a queue widget with no parent. And every widget that shows up within this application window is directly or indirectly a child of that application window. These children are all shown within the coordinate system of the parent. So if you create a push button as a child of your widget and you move it to the position 0, 0, it will show up in the upper left corner of your parent window, not of the desktop. If you move it further away, then um, the child widget will be clipped by the window of the parent. The parent will then propagate state changes down to its tree of children, which means, for example, that if you are disabling, graying out the, the parent window, your desktop window, all buttons and all labels and everything within that window will be disabled as well and not receive user input anymore. The same is for, for hiding and showing a, a window. That's only quite natural behavior in user interfaces because you wouldn't expect to hide a window and uh, have the child window still shown. So all these state changes are propagated automatically down the queue widget tree. To clarify this whole topic a bit, we're now going to show you a demo of a simple window containing a couple of child widgets. Um, it will show you how the um, widget hierarchy works and how the widgets are showing up on the screen. So what you see here is an example of a simple application that will create a total of five widgets that are nested within each other and laid out using simple layouts. You can get the source code for this application online at the same place where you got the video. Just let us walk through this application. 
Line 5 is um, the typical line that creates our queue application object. Remember that we need this queue application object before we can create any other queue widget or um, any queue widget or run the event loop in app.exec at the end. We're creating a widget here, we call it window, and if you look closer, you see that it doesn't get a parent parameter, which means it doesn't have any, so that is a window, a top level. It will show up on the desktop. We're now creating a second widget, a queue label. The label is supposed to show a piece of static text, for example, or image, in our case, a text. And this one does get a parent. The parent is the second parameter to the constructor, and that is our window that we originally created. So this label will show up within the window and um, not on the desktop. The next line we are creating a text edit field, that's a multi-line text edit, that is also a child of this window. We are creating two buttons, one called clear and one called save. They're also ch children of that um, window. Let me close the sidebar so that you can see all of the source code in one. One thing that we haven't yet touched on in, in Qt is um, our layouts. Layouts manage the location where windows show up on the screen. And um, in this case, we're adding the label that we created above and the edit field into a layout, and into one layout. And then in the second layout, we add the clear and save buttons to. Well, uh, further down, we are setting the outer layout, this one created over here, on the window. And within the, for the outer layout, we add a second layout to it to nest the widgets which it, within the, the layout, and we add the inner layout. So if you think about how this um, works out, you can think of it almost as Lego pieces. The widgets will now lay out within the parent window. The, um, the edit field will be on top, and the clear and save buttons will be below. We show the widget in line 27. That's the top level widget, so we're showing the, the application window and then we run the application in line 29. I will now run it, and then you will see how this, these lines of code result in a widget that contains the child window, child widgets I described. One thing, the, uh, we have not taken care of any functionality, so the clear button and the save button will not do anything when you click on them. So don't expect the application to magically um, implement that functionality just because we named the variables like that. So I'm running the application now, and there it is, and it looks exactly like, um, like we expected. We haven't re-implemented any of the widgets, we haven't manually written code to, to lay them out. That's taken care of by the layouts, and all the widgets that we created as children of our top-level window, this is the top-level window, are now showing within the top-level window. So this shows you an example of um, nested widgets where the, the child widgets are sharing the screen, the, the space of the parent widget and are laid out within the coordinate system of the parent widget. What you've seen in this demo was a regular queue widget containing other widgets. This is something that is very common in Qt. There are other widgets as well that are mostly used to arrange others and they're usually called container widgets. Um, even a regular plain queue widget can be used for that. Uh, container widgets aggregate other child widgets, just like in our, in our example. And to lay out the child widgets within the container widget, you would normally use a layout. There are several different kinds of layouts, like horizontal or vertical or boxes, um, or grids, sorry. And um, the process is that you add your child widgets to that layout, and then add that layout to the container widget, and then when you show the container widget, it will automatically, the layouts will take care of automatically um, arranging the geometry of the child widgets. Um, if, you look, uh, if you remember the demo that we just did, the, we haven't manually arranged any of the child widgets. It was done automatically by the layouts combined with the com uh, container widget. In this video, we have introduced you to the Qt object model. It's important to understand that this object model is really just the basis for other technologies that are used in Qt like the signals and slots mechanism and the event distribution that we are going to cover in later videos. We hope that you enjoyed this taste of the Qt Essentials training. For the full experience, including labs, Q&As and additional information, we recommend that you attend 
the full multi-day Acute Essentials training course. The course is available from KDIB or any of the other Acute training partners. For full information, check out acute.noca.com. Thanks for watching.